A very good morning uh, to the final day of the Housing Then Annual Summit, a festival of ideas. Um, which has been a real crescendo of a week as we come to our conclusion. And we got a fantastic session this morning for you. Um, and we look forward to uh, uh, in, I look forward to introducing the speakers shortly. But before I do so, just a couple of words from me. First of all, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jeremy Porteous. I'm the Chief Exec and Founder of the Housing Learning Improvement Network, or Housing Lynn for short. Uh, we've had a fantastic week already so far uh, with actually over 50 uh, speakers who've given up their time to share their ideas, knowledge and expertise to help inform and improve all our sector learning and understanding. And in understanding. Indeed, we've got now a record 630 registrations across the week um, to join us uh, to listen and learn. Uh, and that's been translated into two and a half thousand live streams and people who want to watch the, the recordings at their own time. And uh, as Sally mentioned, we'll be sharing more details about that early next week. She also mentioned that you could use the social media platform. So please do use uh, the hashtag HousingLin or HLIN Summit 24 um, and HLIN uh, if you wish to post any comments or suggestions or things that you've heard that you really like from any of the speakers. If you want to find out a little bit more about the speakers and if you haven't already do so, done so, please look at our microsite and have a look at the speaker profiles there. Now, I just want to sort of say that this session would not be possible without the generous support of, of Guinness Partnership. Uh, Lynn, can I thank you and the team for your ongoing support? Uh, Guinness have been a long-term friend and supporter of the Housing Lynn, not just for our annual summits um, and our conferences, but also as a co-sponsor of our really important dementia pages. And delighted that Lynn, members of your team, are also our co-leads on dementia uh, as we take forward the recommendations of the APPG on housing and dementia, Are We Ready? But the rest of our sponsors are also very much a part of this week. Uh, and a big thanks to our headline sponsors uh, and our associate sponsors who've made this week possible. You may not know that without their support, we not only could not run this event, but we would not be able to run our happy hours and other events and knowledge sharing and exchange platforms and ideas that we run during the course of the year. So again, a big thanks to all of those who are associated with the summit and the LIN in general. Now, turning to this session, uh, really great, great, we can build on the sort of collaborative approaches, thinking about the connectivity around in innovations in mainstream and specialist housing within communities, within place, and also critically about what it means for people living in those, whether they are uh, owner occupiers, whether they are tenants uh, of social housing or indeed rentals, and the impact in their delivering better health housing and social care, something that we in the Housing Lynn call collaborate, a collaborative approaches to ageing. And each of the threads in the next four, four sessions, the four speakers, has something that has a very relevant to this. We're going to kick off with Joe Farrington Douglas, who's a senior policy fellow and public affairs manager at the Health Foundation uh, and part of the team that has written a really influential paper on health and housing. And uh, I won't steal his thunder because I'm going to ask him to kick off shortly. He'll be followed by Nick, Nick Sinclair, Director of Local Area Coordination Network uh, at Community Catalyst. Nick, really pleased that you could be with us here. We've worked closely with Community Catalyst over the years. I'm glad, glad uh, you could represent and be here to talk about uh, the LAC network today. Uh, a long-term supporter and collaborator, uh, Jim Hudson, who follows Nick. Uh, senior Research Associate, uh, Associate at the Social School for Policy Studies, SPS at University of Bristol. You're going to hear about the Sheik Project, uh, a really important piece of work, that, uh, research that came out recently. Uh, and Jim is going to give you an overview uh, of that programme. And we're going to conclude with our sponsor, the Guinness Partnership and Director of Independent Living, Lynn Lewis. Lynn, delighted that you could be with us. Some really innovative thinking that you've got and ideas for taking the partnership forward, both within Guinness as well as your partnerships with local communities as well. So we look forward to hearing from you uh, later. But to start off with, let's kick off with Joe. So, Joe, over to you. Hi. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Let me see if I can share the screen. Um, can you, are you seeing the slide screen? Yeah, is that good? Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for um, uh, for having for hosting me today. Um, I do feel like I'm just going to move my camera over. 
I feel like I'm, uh, you know, something of a wild card for this discussion because I'm not a, a housing policy or a housing specialist. Um, I'm a senior policy fellow for the Health Foundation, um, but I'm hoping to bring a, a health perspective into this discussion. Um, we, we're a think tank and a research founder, uh, a funder, um, but we take a very broad approach to health, um, not thinking just about health and care. Um, and I hope this audience doesn't need to need um, persuading of the importance of housing to health. And we certainly see it as having an important role. Um, so I'm happy to share some of our uh, recent research. I'm going to be providing that broader context of the health and the health and health inequalities across the UK, um, as well as then. So then moving on to the role of health uh, of housing in that and policy proposals um, and some comment on the prospects for change before we then get into the real experts in the sector. Um, so as I go, I can't see the audience and you can't see each other. So it's a slightly artificial environment, but um, you know, do engage in the chat and um, think about some of these questions that I'll be returning to um, as I speak about um, where the UK ranks, which places have the worst health, what do you think has an impact on health, and then the role of housing and housing policy. So I'll start by giving a broad um, overview of the uh, of the role of uh, health and health inequalities uh, and, the, and those trends. Um, I'm going to throw a few charts at you, um, so so bear with me. But um, you know we'd, we'd want to use this use this data to tell a story, and, and all these charts are available on our website. And um, so looking at the at the long the, the sort of medium term trend in uh, life expectancy, which is our, our main measure of health, the long trend sort of look from since the industrial revolution has been improving health as a living as living standards and technology have improved and it, health. Uh, Life expectancy was below 50, believe it or not, um, about 100 years ago, 80 at the turn of the century. But as we can see in this chart, even um, pre-pandemic, there was a levelling off, a slowdown in that improvement um, as health gains have, have seemed to have slowed down um, since around 2010, 2011. There's been a strong debate about that. Um, even before, as you can then see, as we showed in the most recent statistics, a, a, a catastrophic fall off um, in life expectancy during that pandemic period. Um, and this is the same data for, uh, for men. You can see that um, significant drop uh, in the year of the pandemic, some uh, return to the previous trend in that. Um, but really I wanted to draw attention to that, let that uh, slowing down of improvements in health. Um, so, uh, there are 38 countries in the OECD. Where do you think the UK sort of stands in this? The, these trends aren't just, um, these aren't the trend in the slowdown of health improvement hasn't just been in the, in the UK. Um, but pre-pandemic, we were seeing this slowdown in many countries. Um, but in that, in that decade, since 20, 2010, um, the UK fell from 19th place, so it was really right in the middle of the table to about 27th in the most recent. So we're sitting there, this slide's quite small, we're sitting there proudly between Chile and Costa Rica uh, in our life expectancy. Um, other countries have seen a slowdown, but I think we're one of the, one of the outliers along with the US. So how has that slowdown in health uh, improvements being distributed but, uh, socially. Um, this is the this is the improvement in health since uh, between about 2011 and 2019, so the period before the pandemic. And you can see here that uh, higher income groups, higher income places, um, were in, were still enjoying some uh, a faster improvement in health, and that the real slowdown was concentrated at the lower ends. So we've seen an expansion. Uh, of health inequalities in that decade, in that period leading up to the uh, to the pandemic, um, and that blue bar here is showing uh, the distribution uh, and the, uh, the the social gradient in life expectancy across the country. Um, so a ten year gap between the uh, most and the least deprived deciles, um, and then the red bars are showing the the. Um, the social gradient in healthy life expectancy. So years lived in good health, which is an even steeper gradient of uh, 19, nearly 20 years in healthy life expectancy between the most and the least deprived um, places. That's in the pre-pandemic period. And of course, the pandemic has just uh, exacerbated that um, uh, in spades. And the blue, uh, the blue bars here are showing the decline in life expectancy. So it's something of a statistical um, 
expect that to that we we do expect that to um, to come back up again. But you can really see how that uh, that mortality uh, difference uh, during the pandemic uh, really exacerbated health inequalities. So it's a problem that was getting worse before the pandemic has been really exacerbated during that period. And how does this translate into geographic um, inequalities? Um, think amongst yourselves and maybe put in the chat where what places uh, in your experience or your understanding have the worst uh, have the worst health across the country. We know we're quite we're a, um, a geographically unequal uh, country and we expect um, to see that north south divide in health. And that is indeed what we what we see quite starkly here. Um, so if you if you look at the line here for um, for the northeast of England and um, this data is for England and Wales so far. Uh, you can see that every local authority in the northeast is below the UK average life expectancy. Um, and the northwest has the, the poorest health place, uh, with Blackpool being quite an outlier. Um, but there's, there is variation within those regions, and um, some of those places, um, the bottom dot in the southeast is my birth town, Hastings, has the and it's closer to Blackpool than it is to the national average, uh, despite being in the southeast. So there's a lot of variation within those regions as well, and they reflect our, uh, our, our unequal society. And finally, um, this isn't just about uh, longevity, but also about people getting sicker at a younger age. So if you are a poor 30 to 49 year old, so this, this chart um, on the left is showing the number of illnesses, and this is diagnosed, this is NHS data. So if you're a poor 30 to 49 year old, you're living likely to be living with more illness than a rich 50 something. And looking at um, women reaching retirement age of 60, a poorer woman reaching the age of 60 um, is living with the level of illness of a wealthy 75 year old. But you do see that, and I'll draw attention that that gap opens up throughout the life course. So it opens up in the 20s. So if you just focus on policies for older people, you're not going to um, be tackling the, the long term factors that, uh, that build up health, which leads to my next question, which is you know, what makes us healthy? Um, what are the factors that are driving these overall trends in health and health inequalities? Um, and it's a question that we often ask our audiences and we ask the public in polls and in focus groups. And often the answers are quite individualistic. Um, that's often the way that the media and the way that industry frames the question of health, looking at individual lifestyle behavior. Um, but so we're working um, with an organization called Frameworks about how we can reframe that conversation to really focus on the wider determinants, such as um, income, housing, work, um, transport, education, so that uh, and, and to really drive a better understanding of those building blocks of health so that we as a society are trying to um, fix those building blocks rather than just focusing on the symptoms. So looking at housing, um, we need somewhere to, um, we all need somewhere to call home. Um, and that is a, a, one of the fundamental building blocks of health and is also one that's quite um, understandable um, to people. Everybody has that experience of living in a home and can relate to how it affects their health. Um, um, sadly, in the in the last few years, we've seen more and more headlines about the impact of uh, poor housing on health. So it is an opportunity. It's it's a, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us to tell that story. So, what aspects of housing um, affect health? As people working day to day in the in housing and in housing uh, services, you've got much more experience than me of kind of seeing that in your in your practice. So, what aspects of housing affect health? I'm going to give a, a kind of research or a statistical uh, view of that. Um, but we, we, the way that we look at this is through the lenses of affordability, quality and security. Um, we know that housing costs are unaffordable. For many, um, three and a half million households in England live in non-decent homes um, and many people living in very insecure housing tendencies. These all have an impact on health individually, but they also group together. They group together, they affect the same groups of people, but also having multiple housing problems has multiple uh, impacts on, on health. And you can see that having multiple housing problems has a, a stronger and, and deeper impact on your health. Looking firstly at housing quality, um, as I mentioned, three and a half million households in England live in non-decent homes. And that means that they're living with damp, cold, outdated and dilapidated uh, environments. 
Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, that has a, a, a very strong relation with uh, with socioeconomic status or with uh, with income. So you can see that uh, that social gradient with with some protection for the lowest quintile, you have more access to social housing. Um, so it's sometimes the, the just um, above that, uh, just above that level that are most exposed. Um, and so a lot of our research has been focusing on the uh, on the impact in the private rented sector. Um, private renters are most exposed to um, to non decent housing, although there are more non decent homes in the owner occupied sector, and that also needs to be need to be looked at. Um, we, we've seen improvements in the social rented sector. Um, so the government has itself set a target for improving uh, home, uh, decent home standards in the private rented sector. Um, and that could should be achievable because we've achieved it in the social housing sector. Um, and organisations like the BRE try and estimate the impact of this on uh, on healthcare and on healthcare costs. Um, they they estimate around one and a half to two billion, but I think that's an underestimate because it's only looking at hospital admissions that are directly related to housing issues. But I think the the wider costs of health poor housing are much are much wider than that. Looking at affordability, um, housing costs are unaffordable for more than a quarter of families on the lowest incomes. And so that means, means that more than a third of their income goes on housing. And again, that is socially graded. So there's impact much, uh, much more on the lowest income. Um, again, that's that's not surprising. Um, the the what, what is um, what it also really stands out is how that is particularly a problem for private renters. And we've seen that as a long term trend, not something that's been resolved. Um, but unaffordability has really increased and opened up in the private rented sector, um, in large part due to the freeze in local housing allowance rates. Um, and this is uh, this is research from one of our partners, uh, Cri uh, Crisis, showing in, in that map, I think the green areas are the areas of the country where you could reasonably um, afford a home on um, the local local housing allowance. So 94% of areas of Britain simply not affordable in the local housing allowance, but particularly once it was frozen. And that rent gap represents a, a harm to health. The people run up debt and they cut back on heating, food and essentials, or they face moving into substandard or an overcrowded homes. And here we see um, uh, uh, the overall trends in increases in overcrowding um, and the overcrowded homes are more likely to lead to psychological distress. Um, and also related to this next question of housing security, um, which is the sort of third leg of the stool of the impact of, of health on housing. Um, it has been in political debates on housing security this week, which I'll, I'll come back to as at, um, at an event in Parliament this week where that was um, very much top of the agenda. Um, but it's not often, not, it's not always been framed as, as a health issue, but actually we see that children who are living in the private center, rented sector are more likely to move home multiple times um, over their life. Um, and that moving multiple times has uh, a correlation with, uh, with worse health. Um, it disrupts education, it disrupts communities, um, and it, it has then an impact on the uh, physical and mental health. And at its worst, it then tips into people um, losing their home altogether and moving into a temporary accommodation and here are the um, statistics from the latest English housing survey um, showing that particular increase, particularly for um, families with children uh, being forced into temporary accommodation. So we see those three elements of um, housing that lead to health, um, housing quality, housing security and affordability. We can show those trends, but we can also describe the mechanisms by which they translate into poor health. So living in poorer housing means you're exposed to mold, more asthma attacks, you're living in a cold home, that's worse for your heart health. Housing security has an impact on psychological distress um, and that accumulates and translates into physical health as well. Um, and, and living in unaffordable housing has an impact on your access to, uh, to uh, healthy food and, and the essentials for a decent standard of life. So those are the overall trends. As a think tank, we want to be um, uh, thinking about what, what can be done about it. Um, and as, as participants here as well, you know, what policies would you call for? Or do you think we should be calling for? Um, I warn you, the next slide contains uh, an image of a previous prime minister, but he did actually come up with um, you know, that levelling up 
uh, manifesto for 2019 um, had quite strong promises for improving uh, improving standards of uh, housing for including for renters. So the long-awaited renters reform bill uh, was published last year and prevents that uh, and does provide an opportunity to end no fault evictions um, and to extend non uh, extend decent home standards. So we welcome that, welcomed and continue to welcome that focus on um, housing security. Um, but yes, it won't have escaped your notice that, that that those reforms are at risk at the moment as they seem to be um, backtracking on even the promises that were made in the in the, in the existing bill, um, which already has quite a few loopholes in it. Um, so with all, the worry is that that's gonna be kicked into the long grass. Um, other policy areas that would have an impact on uh, housing and health would be extending that decent home standard that we saw had a big impact in the social housing sector um, and see and um, expanding that and extending that to the private rented sector, um, which is something we've been calling for and something that has been introduced into that bill as well. Um, but we will see where that, um, that ends up. Um, not before it is extended to the private rented sector, the government has said that the standard needs to be updated and, and we agree um, that the standard is 20 years old and we've proposed ways that the uh, decent home standard needs to be improved um, to meet modern levels of thermal comfort and energy efficiency, um, as well as uh, introducing connectivity as part of the definition of a decent home. Um, but how will that even be enforced, just, just putting it into legislation doesn't mean it will actually happen. Um, local authorities need to have the powers and the resources to be able to actually go in and inspect homes and ensure that they are meeting that standard. And there needs to be investment and support to ensure that our very leaky and outdated homes, um, that, that the owners of those are able to access um, the funding and the resource that they need to be able to, in, to, to invest. Um, uh, sadly, again, it's another area that's at risk. Um, the, 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 the recent U-turn on the green um, investment plan announced by Starmo, um, the main victim of that was the investment in home insulation. So that's a real concern that that, um, that agenda is um, under threat. Um, and we're just starting to see the housing and the health sector coming out, come out to draw attention to the impact on this and to put the challenge back on to um, all political parties to say how they will address the problem of our um, our outdated and leaky um, housing, not just for uh, not just for climate change, but for also for um, protecting health. Closing the affordability gap, um, as I've said, the freezing of the local housing allowance had created this big gap, and in the last budget, the chancellor did announce that 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 um, free that freeze would be unfrozen. Um, but then it's going to go back into the freeze. So it's a, a one-off increase in the local housing allowance. So that will help. Um, but there's a concern there's not a long-term plan for this. And of course, the long-term plan is for meeting, uh, is, is that you need to have the supply that meets demand. Um, so you know, we support the calls of, across the rest of the sector for increasing the supply of housing, particularly for increasing social homes. Um, and the policy situation in this is, uh, is that the, uh, the potentially the next government will um, intend to increase, expand the supply of housing, um, but they haven't um, sort of committed to the numbers of social homes that we think need to be uh, need to be provided. So that's the um, that's the final um, policy that will need to be protected, and I hope that that's not uh, not you turned on as well. So there's some positive. So that some optimism that there might be some change ahead. Um, our report, Moving to Healthy Homes, um, sets out some of the evidence that I've presented here today, as well as some of our policy proposals. So thank you for inviting me to share that with you. Um, I hope it's kind of gives some context to the discussion today. Um, but we're not just researching, we're also campaigning um, to change. Uh, and I'm working on our project on uh, called Health Equals, which is about creating a, a cross-sector campaign to draw attention and to force, uh, force political parties to actually make a commitment to reduce health inequalities over the next decade. And um, so do take a look at Health Equals um, and, and you know, if you want, you can sign up and support that campaign as well. So thank you for um, having me today and I look forward to the discussion later.
Joe, thank you very much. Um, you may not be aware that Lord Nigel Crisp um, spoke at this session last year, um, oh. and he was also, uh, you may know, so was trying to put forward the Healthy Homes Act through the town yeah. and country planning legislation. So your evidence here really helps us better understand both the sort of experiences around tackling health inequalities, you know, deprived neighbourhoods, poverty and social economic issues, but also what that means in those local communities to create better healthy living places. Um, and from a housing perspective, the other aspect is we want to see people adopting the building a healthy life design principles as well. Now, that isn't about retrofitting our existing community, it's about new build, but that may be another area that we can partner with you going forward. So, Joe, really fascinating uh, presentation. We're going to move on to Nick, Nick, Nick Sinclair from the Local Area Coordination Network. And Nick, there may be a lot of overlap here uh, because many of your members will also have issues around tackling their own individual health inequalities and also the neighbours that you operate in. So, Nick, over to you. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, and thanks, Joe, for that fabulous uh, presentation there. Yeah, it does follow on, I think, quite nicely from that because I think what I'm going to talk about is an idea an idea that seeks to help redress some of those determinants that Joe's talking about that's uh, um, taking root in different parts of the country. Um, it's called Local Area Coordination, and I'm responsible for supporting the development of it in different parts of the country. I've got a presentation to share, and uh, it'd be great to hear some um, comments from you throughout the chat and to have a bit of a chat about it afterwards if, if, you, if you're interested. Um, hopefully I can share my screen. Hopefully that's, yeah, you see that, brilliant. I'm just going to make this a little smaller. Fab. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, I'm going to share this presentation about the idea of local area coordination. Um, but just to say, I work for a company called Community Catalyst. So I work for a community interest company. Community Catalysts are working in all sorts of different parts of the country in all sorts of different ways. A lot of the work being around supporting the development of micro enterprises. Um, but the work I lead is specifically local area coordination, which is a, a local authority led initiative. Um, that's that's taking root in, in different parts of the country. But just to give you a bit of a background to this idea, it's it's one that was born in Western Australia back in the 1980s. Um, and at the time, they'd realised that a lot of people were who were particularly in more rural, isolated parts of uh, the state were experiencing poorer outcomes as a consequence of not being connected with the right type of support in the right way at the right time for them. And a lot of that was because services were quite centralized and inaccessible. So the idea of local area coordination was really born from there, really. Um, the idea of, of a, a coordinator being based in and alongside communities with people, connecting with people, helping people to identify their vision of a good life and move closer to it, really. Um, connecting with all the uh, assets and supports that might be available, both locally within the community and within the wider service system. And really, that's that's this, the philosophy that remains at its heart today, very much uh, driven by a set of principles and um, very much about starting with that person, with that family and working outwardly from there. And um, that picture there on the side is just a picture of a book called Power and Connection that we published at the end of 2021. If you're interested, it sort of brings up to date all the evidence about local area coordination and examples that you can have a look at. But it's available online for free as well as a, as a PDF if, if you're interested in the stuff I'm talking about here. Very briefly, these are the areas of England and Wales, who uh, is, uh, is the, the network that I'm responsible for through my work at Community Catalysts in supporting the development of. Um, and these are the areas that are doing local area coordination today. Um, so there are 120 local area coordinators employed by these different local authorities. They're all based in communities of populations around eight to 10,000. So fairly local, hyper-local. Um, and their work, I suppose, collectively is reaching a population of around about 1 million people, people who could draw upon the uh, time and support of a local area coordinator if they wanted. Um, but this group worked together very much as a network. It's a network that we convene and support the development of. I'll mention a little bit about how that works later on. Um, and the organisation I work for, Community Catalyst, are the national development organisation for local area coordination. So we support the design and development of it in, in every area from start to finish, really, of getting it going to establishing the whole sort of process to um, that those local area coordinators eventually becoming part of that network. So that's where it's currently happening today and it's it's growing all the time. They're all at different points of the development. Some have been doing it for a long time. 
Derby, for instance, well over 12 years now. Um, and then Oxfordshire, South Tyneside, they're just recruiting their first local area coordinators at the moment. So collectively working together, sharing knowledge and experience over that time um, at different stages of their development. So what's it about? Um, this is a quote from Ralph, who's the founder of our network and the, the person who brought it here to the UK in the first place uh, from Australia. And he says it's about people living rich and fulfilling lives, having supportive natural relationships, being active, valued, contributing citizens and really paying attention to nurturing family resilience and this creating the condition for reducing demand and dependency on services and funding. So as I said, it's about taking that kind of whole person approach, working outwardly from that person's vision of a good life and that being the starting point for what local area coordination looks and feels like for that person. So it's for people of all ages, including those who are often labelled as having complex needs, uh, labelled by um, the system, I suppose. I'm focusing on all aspects of a person and not just some elements of their life. And it's about thinking about the whole, the person in the context of their wider family, their wider support system, their whole community, and also the wider uh, system of services and supports that exists around that person. What I find a lot in my work is there is an enormous amount of support available within communities, but not always reaching people. And a lot of that being about people's um, own sense of disconnection from it, their own personal isolation, perhaps it might be about they just don't know or um, it doesn't make sense or there's a sense of confidence or pride that might be kind of holding people back. So local area coordination is really supposed to be present and available within the community so you can connect with people in the right way at the right time to build that trusting relationship and then help people explore their options in, in the right way for them. That picture on the side there is just some of the local area coordinators in our network at one of the, the gatherings that we had. It's based on 10 principles. So they work outwardly from these principles rather than from a set of KPIs and targeted interventions. This is about really working from uh, a, a different philosophy. And I'm not going to read through them all, but you can see them there. For me, the ones that have really resonated with me over the few years of doing this has been about, about relationships and citizenship, the natural authority of people and families to be in charge of their own lives and choosing and controlling supports in, in whatever way works best for, for us as people. Uh, but the importance of working together, um, working together within that the context of the wider system and all the supports that surround the, the people and family, but with people and families absolutely the centre of that. And I think for me, the most important one about contribution, that we are all citizens of our communities and we have gifts and talents and we have things to share. And how can we get through the things that are getting in the way of all of that and go on to make our contribution in whatever way that makes sense to us. It might be in a formal uh, role as a volunteer or, or, or something like that, or it could be as staying as a, a valued in a valued role as a trusted family member for as long as possible, whatever it might be. So local area coordinator is somebody who works these principles that I've just outlined. They're based in a community. They walk alongside people. The coordinator is in the area, not of the area. So their job is to help people to identify their own plan, whatever that might look like for them, and to help them coordinate that in whatever way that works best. Always thinking about what are the natural supports available, what um, what um, solutions can be found within the wider community before thinking about services. So they can be introduced to anyone, by anyone. Uh, so there's no referral pathway to this. It's a process of introduction. So a lot of people are introduced via social workers, GPs, housing colleagues, people working in the wider services. But equally from local groups, organisations, family members, friends, whoever it is, meet people where they're at, starting from that point of their vision of a good life, taking the time to understand that and the wider picture that's going on. Importantly, not seeking to fix people, but rather helping people plan, as I said. So helping people to always be in the driving seat of their own life, even if they feel under very under-resourced and facing kind of points of urgency and crisis in their life. It's always about helping people to stay in control and regain control. It's about helping people build their personal networks, connect with local resources, thinking creatively, helping practically along the way. And the importance of local partnerships um, with services and people at the centre. And a lot of the work being around supporting and growing community activity too, um, and uh, supporting in that, in, that, in that similar sort of way, walking alongside groups and organisations and helping them nurture and develop their work and growing community from helping people who might be on the edge of the community to connect with that and become a contributing member of it. And then sharing, the, sharing those learnings and insights back into the system. So each of those areas I've shown you has a, a leadership group behind it, a cross-system leadership group, trying to learn from this approach, trying to use those principles and that learning to 
to make, make meaningful change in the wider system. And those outcomes that we're seeing are quite interesting. We know there's been 17 evaluations done on it to date in this country. There's a big National Institute Health Research funded evaluation coming out very soon. It's been going on for the last three and a half years. But the outcomes we're seeing for those people and families, obviously helping people to achieve better lives, communities it's supporting more inclusive, strong and welcoming places. And for services, it's helping services to connect together around people and families at the centre, providing opportunities for change, system change, co-producing with local people and reducing and diverting costs. So instead of people going to the front door of services for support, they're finding their own solutions from within their own life, their own community in a different way through a different conversation. This rather busy slide is just to take me onto the bit around housing, really. It's just these, this is the common sort of outcomes that we're seeing within local area coordination that we're working with and to as a network. And you can see the green bits in the air in the middle there, very much about helping people to who might be experiencing some urgency or point of crisis in their life um, to achieve um, the, 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 the resources they need in order to sort of sustain things and stabilize things. A lot of this about housing and um, well over half of the people who are introduced to local area coordinators or well over half of the people who connect with the local area coordinator, there is some concern that around housing um, that is part of that trigger for why they connected with them in the first place. Um, but that's just to give you a sense really of the multiple kind of outcomes that people are achieving, not the local area coordinators achieving, that people are achieving in their own lives with the local area coordinator alongside them, helping them to get to where they want to be. And these are some of those people. These are some of the stories that we celebrated last year, the year before, um, thinking about um, people who were keen to share their story and what what they did and the difference that local area coordination helped to make for them. So Chris, Mamuna, Glyn, Ashley, all of whom had some concerns around housing uh, that were going on in their life that was stopping them from sharing their gifts, stopping them from being themselves. And all introduced from different points of contact in different ways. Uh, Chris kind of connected through his local authority, through the customer services. Mamuna was introduced from a social worker following hospital discharge. Glyn was from his elected uh, counsellor. And Ashley is from a GP. But all started from, you know, what's going on? Let's work it out from there. And um, the relationship that built over time with their local area coordinator. And all of whom went to achieve more positive housing outcomes as a consequence over time. Um, just finishing up now, really, uh, this is just to give you a sense of that, how we keep this going. Um, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, the network being really important to this. Um, this is about learning and sharing and sharing ideas and resources together collectively. So here's a picture of uh, one of the gatherings. This is the national gathering we had last year and some of the network gathering together there. Um, all of whom are committed to these principles, committed to trying to help each other to sustain and develop this. And it, I've, I've been involved in, in this for the last five years and prior to that 10 years of working in housing and homelessness support. But I've never found a group of people so energized and committed around an idea. And it's just been the most exciting uh, journey to be on. And it really is palpable when you when you, we have these gatherings and seeing people connect and share and challenge each other. It's, it's one of the best things about this this work from my perspective. And really, this is the last thing I want to share is that all of this is about designing and developing with local people at the heart of it. So every area that's doing local area coordination works closely with community groups and organisations, but local residents, and they have a say in who they select as their local area coordinator. Um, and here's a picture of Dan from Surrey County Council uh, with some local folks from an area where they were developing local area coordination. And it's just a tweet that I, I shared and one that made me laugh at the time, probably not that funny, but is what community recruitment of local area coordinators looks like when you've had so many rich discussions, you've overrun in the church hall and you need to make way for the local ballet class, but you're not quite done making decisions. Um, so this, I suppose it's just to reinforce the importance of local people having a say and being involved in the design and development of all of this uh, and selecting their local area coordinator um, right from the start in partnership with the councils who are recruiting them. So if you're interested in finding out any more about all this, um, you can have a look on our website, lacnetwork.org. There's plenty more evidence and testimony on there. And that's my email address. Please do just drop me an email if this sounds like something that has spoken to you personally or is, is resonates with work that you're leading and trying to develop and grow. I'd be really interested to hear about it. Um, we always say 
it always starts from a conversation. So please do feel free to get in touch. And thanks very much again, uh, Jeremy and everyone at Housing Lynn for inviting me to, to contribute today. Nick, thank you. Really brilliant presentation. Um, what, what you may not know is that for years we've been big fans of asset-based community development, um, ABCD for, for people who don't know sort of the acronym. Um, and last year, Cormac Russell talked about his new book, The Connected Community. What you've demonstrated this morning really is the locality, you know, how those local locations are starting to, to really to take hold. Um, and I, you know, all power to the elder of you but, and your team. And uh, you're certainly catalysts for this in those communities. Um, so well done. And I do encourage people to to look at um, the research when it comes out, to demo, which will evidence the, the real positivity and benefit. We're going to move on, though, I'm afraid, Nick, slightly, but we'll come back to some questions with you shortly, I hope, um, because we'll look at another aspect of, of community building, very much from um, a co-housing perspective. Um, and Jim's been leading a really innovative project, um, also, I think, funded by the NIHR, if I remember rightly, but Jim can correct me if, if I'm wrong, um, and uh, which, looked at, uh, which looks at collaborative approaches, both within the housing, but also looking at innovations in care within, with regard to that. So, Jim, let me pass over to you. Sure. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, so uh, we've just reached the conclusion back in January, actually, of this uh, of this. Um, two and a half, almost three year project, uh, Collaborative Housing and Innovation in Care, or CHIC for short. Um, and I was just, it was it was an interesting reminder listening to, uh, particularly to uh, Joe's uh, presentation about the um, kind of what you might see as overwhelmingly negative data, I suppose, um, against which uh, talking about collaborative housing models might seem quite aspirational. Many people often query it thinking um well this is this is all great but there's a there's a housing crisis generally how can we how can we begin to look at this but there's also a social care crisis uh, uh to make that as an understatement really um so i think uh looking as, as well it was interesting what nick was saying i think that that kind of leads into what i'm going to talk about quite well in that um uh, the the housing crisis and the social care crisis and the way we live and well-being um, and and deprivation are, are all interlinked issues i think which which kind of come to a focus in a way in in uh, the possibilities of some of these schemes um so anyway uh, going on to our our work uh, overall so a lot's been written I guess, about the potential of community-led or collaborative housing, especially co-housing as, as a model for better aging through mutual support uh, and reduced loneliness and greater well-being in later life. Um, but a couple of years ago, myself and uh, a small team at the uh, University of Bristol uh, got funding to really kind of go into depth with some of these groups, which although a lot of positive um, stuff has been said already there's very little empirical solid research that actually explores that and looks at the positives and also at some of the uh, the challenges um so we've uh we've just uh, produced this report which you can read and or download um from our website or well, there's a qr code there as well for uh, that takes you directly uh to it apparently um so uh, just describing the Sheik project overall, our, our basic question was was this, in what ways might collaborative housing meet the uh, social care and support needs of older people? Um, so we did this in-depth research, as I say, and it's probably, um, rather than talking about the technicalities of that, the, I suppose two key questions are what do we mean here by social care and what do we mean by collaborative housing um so starting with with care it's an important question because it's not what we what might normally be taken or the or the narrower um definition of social care we we acknowledged and we include um the spectrum of services and activities by professional carers and agencies um, around daily living and managing finances and other support services that might traditionally be taken as as social care but we're also talking about 
um, a kind of more indirect or less direct um, activities and relationships uh, that's, that's not formal care, but um, in these uh, kinds of collaborative housing groups delay the need for formal care services or, or for family support, where that's quite often these days not um, forthcoming. Um, and and in terms of collaborative housing, it's probably best if I talk about the actual uh, uh, case studies here. So we looked at six um, projects, um, three of which were co-housing. And some of, some of the audience, I guess, will be familiar with co-housing, um, but for those not, um, so their uh, their intentional, so-called intentional housing communities created and run by their residents. Each household uh, has a self-contained private home as well as shared community space, but there's also a, an active commitment by those um, members or residents to come together to to maintain and create that community through shared activity and such as um, eating together regularly. Um, so of the three that we looked at, there's one scheme that's explicitly so-called senior co-housing with a, with a lower age limit um, of the three. Uh, and if you're wondering, by the way, uh, you're thinking, I recognize one or two of these schemes and that's not the name. All of the schemes uh, that we looked at as uh, case studies are anonymized, um, which wasn't a requirement of every scheme, but it uh, it was uh, easy to do overall, although um, confusing if you're involved in uh, community-led housing. Um, so we were very interested in co-housing, which is the model most talked about, about kind of um, good aging and, and later life. But we also uh, spread our wings slightly um, beyond that. And we wanted to look at some other models that we thought had potential and actually uh, possibly more potential in terms of, of reaching more diverse communities than co-housing so far um, has done. And we looked at these three other schemes. So we've got a, uh, the first is a, just on the left, is a, is a, a, a retirement scheme that was actually built as a completely speculative uh, retirement housing but a few years ago the residents through the right to manage legislation uh, took over the management of that block uh, the second is um, something where the the management company owned and run by the residents was built in from the start but is closer to extra care it has additional services which those residents are able to draw on um, and the third one is one of very few housing co-ops explicit, explicitly for older people that we're aware of in the UK we only know of two actually although there, there might be more but they tend to um, fly under the radar in the context of this kind of uh, community research um, so what were our, our key findings? Uh, two and a half years, well, two years of field work is a, is a lot of data collection, which um, not all of which we've, um, we've even crunched through still. So there, there's a lot of findings. So, so this is by no means uh, everything that came out of this. Uh, the report uh, that's available to read uh, goes into uh, 55 pages of detail on this, if, uh, if you're so... Um, uh, interested in that. Um, so key key findings overall, I guess um, uh, there's there's broad benefits of living in self managed um, collaborative communities, which is which is kind of particularly in the co housing is is what we were uh, uh, more expecting a high degree of sociability and motion and, and mutual support, and it affirms what advocates of co housing have long said. But uh, but there's previously been a lack of, of in-depth empirical research, as I said. Um, for the other three, for those partially autonomous groups, as, as we're calling them, um, our, our first finding actually was that the, the, the residents hadn't particularly moved in um, to the scheme because of its self-management model. And some of those residents took very little part. So for instance, in the, in the housing co-op, it wasn't a necessity to be on the management committee and be involved in that way. But um, one of the things we quickly realized that was that there were very practical um, uh, benefits of those those self-managed kind of other autonomous communities, the um, the housing co-op and the other two. 
Um, we did find a, a compar comparably higher degree of sociability and day-to-day -day mutual support for those groups, um, at least amongst a kind of active core of members. But we also found that the act of self-management or the need for self-management also supported, underpinned the sociability of those communities. But in terms of practical benefits, um, it's sometimes easy to kind of overlook um, the, the degree of control over costs and services and housing to differing extents that, that these groups had. One example that um, I often talk about is the, the housing co-op, um, which is in a, a major city in the north of England, um, shared its um, services and its site management with a uh, registered provider literally next door who occupied some of the housing. Um, and at some point, four or five years ago, those services were removed or the, the registered provider stopped the funding for those services for its housing. The co-op reorganised itself and decided to keep those staff uh, and and services and actually at a lower cost weirdly it um it turned out in the end uh, because they have very um very low overhead costs but um going a bit deeper i'm aware uh time's ticking i could talk about this for hours um i'll skip over uh, to some degree the, the the level of mutual support and emotional care that occurred in in all of these um, communities other than it's it's important to acknowledge which i think uh, has been spoken about already um that care um is not just about uh practical physical care but but that broader issue of well-being and emotional care that of having people around of having good neighbors which these uh kinds of communities um support but what really came out particularly in the in the three co-housing projects was what we're calling intermediary or advocacy roles where uh a, an individual in that group uh transitioned into having greater care need either as a chronic condition or um, sadly, in some cases, uh, it needed uh, palliative care, um, so a, a terminal condition. And members of that community, smaller groups within that commun those communities, stepped up to not to provide the care that they needed personally, but to organise the care, which is a uh, quite a big thing in itself to to provide that advocacy that sometimes a an adult child might provide to that person and and still did sometimes it was a negotiation between those parties but but taking on that role of the person who liaises between the gp and health services and social care which if you've had if you work in those sectors or if you've had personal experience of those recently is is often chaotic um we we also looked at aspects of design and and kind of, uh, it was interesting that in all the groups, to some degree, there was a resistance to actually planning for future care need, particularly, that sounds contradictory to what I've been talking about so far, but particularly in um, some of the co-housing groups, I think the ethos of the of the co-housing is, is not to be institutional, is not to have those care services on board, but to take a more uh, preventative approach through through well-being and being in a very supportive community but we do wonder in the future and we we've, we've got kind of pointers in our report towards this about whether um other agencies given the complexities and and burden of taking on actual care services and cqc registration whether there's a role for external agencies to provide that to some of these groups as they already do in the case of the extra care like uh, self managed community that we looked at. Uh, that's just a very quick example of of how we looked in detail at the care relationships within and beyond uh, uh, one of the uh, co housing groups. Um, I won't talk through it, but it's, uh, it's interesting to understand the complexity of those relationships and how um, children can still be involved in supporting a parent but are not always living close by or are not always that close or understanding of their the um, the individual's needs um i uh, i'm nearly out of time so i won't talk in detail about um the recommendations 
but um, except to say really uh, a, a couple of points, more kind of discussion points really in terms of local government and and to specialist housing providers and registered providers. Firstly, to recognise the benefits of, of choice control and the power of, um, of self-help that's implicit in these collaborative housing uh, projects. Um, and to ensure, I know this is certainly the case in Bristol, um, with a, a group of us are working towards this, to ensure that local planning authorities in particular understand the benefits of collaborative housing schemes for older people, to counter fears that I've often heard stated that they'd increase the call on adult social services by older people uh, kind of moving in en masse to a particular uh, borough, which is something of a myth i i realize as well as i'm talking through these they might sound rather glib given the immense financial pressures or or even financial uh collapse almost that local authorities are, are currently under so i say so say all of these as kind of almost ideals really um i'll just um zip on to um uh working with um specialist housing providers and registered providers um there's a lot we think to learn from co-housing examples and their designers and the design processes to encourage greater sociability and mutual support um and actually there's there's one or two agencies housing 21 in particular if you're not familiar with some projects that they're getting off the ground at the moment are looking to to do a kind of co-housing model i think they have 10 sites in uh, uh in birmingham um, that's really addressing some of the questions that come up with co-housing about accessibility by uh, more diverse and uh, poorer communities. Um, and actually, uh, myself and Karen, who uh, oh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, was not able to uh, join me in this presentation today. Um, uh, my colleague Karen and I have written a chapter in a in a uh, recent. Uh, advisory document by Housing 21 and the UK Ho Co-Housing Network, which you might find interesting on this uh, on this theme. So uh, I will uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Jim, thanks ever so. Really uh, rich information there as always. And in fact, we had to hear Idris from Housing 21 speaking earlier this week and drawing attention to the scheme uh, in Birmingham, and particularly for the Bangladeshi community, as part of our session on equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and so uh, that work and their, their strategy is, is certainly something we want to follow with interest and uh, as well as from, not just from the, uh, the, the sort of physical architecture, but the social architecture of its position within the local community. Well, look, I know that uh, you know, we, we've, we've covered a lot already, but Lynn, um, I'm going to pass over to you because actually you've got lots of fantastic projects and ideas taking place within Guinness. And I'm uh, really delighted that you could join us uh, this morning as sponsor of this session. Um, and I'm sure what we've heard from Joe, Nick and Jim has also stimulated further thoughts and ideas as well. So um, over to you, Lynn. Oh, completely, Jeremy, and thanks everybody for having me. And I'm absolutely delighted to be representing uh, Guinness this morning. Um, Jerome, next slide, please. Um, so Guinness set up back in sort of 1890. Um, this is just a little um, quote, really, from when we kind of first started, and I don't think any of us on the call would would disagree with the need for abundant supply of air, water, heat and light. And um, that remains the absolute necessity, doesn't it, for, you know, the prerequisites for kind of good housing. And, and as we've heard today, um, a healthy kind of approach to, to life in older age. Next slide, please, Jerome. I'm going to sail through these first ones because they're literally about kind of who we are. But essentially, um, from those kind of humble be beginnings in 1890, we're now kind of 64,000 homes strong, working across 130 local authorities in the country and continuing to invest in our communities local charities, creating jobs and skills. And today, you know, our, our purpose is no different to what it was back in the 1890s in so much as we're here to improve people li people's lives and create possibilities for them. And in the space of 
later living um nowhere more important really than than big organizations like guinness it's incumbent on us really to get it right and to move that conversation forward as much as we possibly can so moving on jerome please so just a little map there just telling you where our geography is um and the kind of the seven areas across the country that we concentrate on these days and the next one please jerome and just the numbers really about us, but essentially a thousand homes for agency managed, covering anything from residential care these days through to women fleeing domestic violence. And then seven, approximately seven and a half thousand homes for um, older people. Um, a lot of that is traditional, um, what you would call commonly call sheltered housing, some with um, a presence on site during the week and at weekends, others without any, simply some digital um, ward and call alarm equipment. Um, and then kind of a nice portfolio of extra care housing. We've got 13 schemes up and down the country and a further 250 homes for people with learning disabilities. I won't dwell on the numbers. Jerome, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks. So getting to the nub, really, of what we've talked about today and some of the no's. Um, I was reading a piece um, published by the Health, the Times Health Commission just uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they thought that there was approximately um, 750,000 homes designated for later life with a population of 12 million aged 65 and over these days. Some people in the chat have been talking this morning about um, the need really to get that security of, of housing and particularly in later life. I was on a very, very interesting call um, last week with colleagues from Abbeyfield and they are, they're highlighting the fact that there's a 500,000 older people living in per, um, private rented housing these days at the very times in their lives where their income diminishes and they so desperately need security of tenure. I think we would all agree that there absolutely needs to be a relaxation of grant conditions and nominations agreements across the country if we are to stand any chance as um, providers of um, social housing to create communities that we really can stand behind and that we're absolutely proud of. And in a similar vein, a relaxation of the planning laws. We know that Homes England are doing what they can in terms of the affordable housing programme and um, are very generously saying that that can be put into um, regeneration projects, but not everybody um, has the luxury of a regeneration scheme at their disposal that they can put, put that recycled grant into. So those pressures that we all face in the housing community of needing to shore up our, our approach to building safety and to respond to damp and mould are front and centre of all of the work that we do these days. And it's really important that we find ways in which we can recycle that grant. And again, Abbeyfield saying that they've had some success with their retrofitting these days, which is, which is really good news. And just this week, um, Lord Best and his team, um, as well as the housing, Lynn, have given feedback, haven't they, on the regeneration of outdated sheltered housing and how we're going to take that forward. So really just some kind of what we know is there. Next slide, please, Jerome. And I suppose for me, um, somebody that's been doing this for many, many years now, and, and particularly working in specialist housing, um, I'm passionate, really, really passionate, as, as indeed Guinness is, as indeed you all are on the call, about the initiatives that we do to alleviate loneliness and isolation. Um, we've worked for many years with an organisation called In Common at our sheltered housing schemes in London. Um, it's just an incredibly heartwarming um, initiative. 
it builds those bridges and absolutely dispels myths. It starts conversations between the generations. And, and we all know, don't we? And as my colleagues have very eloquently said on this call today, any opportunity to alleviate that loneliness and isolation and create com communities that aren't necessarily age specific going forward. Those age specific um, housing environments that we all know and love can only go so far, can't they, at um, responding to the needs of an aging population. Joe posed the question, didn't he, earlier about what makes us healthy? And, and housing providers, we really can't support all of the indicators, but what we can do is start to think more linear, really, about what we have in our portfolios and how we can develop in the future to make things a little bit more community-based. Nick talked, didn't he, about um, fulfilling lives, the whole person, the whole community, citizenship and working together. And then Jim finished off um, with that kind of that, that one-liner, better aging through mutual support in order to delay those health interventions. Next slide, please, Jerome. And again, we've been working with an organization called LAST, the Learning and Sharing Together, um, and just some really lovely feedback from that event. You know, we, we canvassed uh, a bunch of kids before they went into our schemes and they thought that older people had thick glasses, snored a lot. You don't need to be old. I can testify to the fact that I've got thick glasses and I snore, sadly. But, you know, they thought it was all about knitting and tea dancing and false teeth and walking sticks. And then lo and behold, you know, the next the next um, piece of feedback said that they thought that older people were kind, were wise, were very bright and intelligent, cheerful and sweet. Well, I hope I've got all of those attributes as I get older in life. Moving on then, please, Jerome. So we've talked a little bit, haven't we, uh, as a sector about pro providing good quality housing for an aging population. And we've talked today at length about intergenerational and co-housing as being more attractive development projects. I too am gonna be watching Housing 21's developments um, around co-housing up there in Birmingham and hopefully we'll be able to kind of have a look at that very soon. Jeremy himself coined the collaborate phrase, didn't he, when he talked about a time when central and local government and house builders would all be working together and we would all be able to build thriving intergenerational communities. Um, just next slide, please, Jerome. Just wanted to talk about a really exciting opportunity that I've got all my fingers and toes crossed for um, down in Exeter. Um, Guinness, Guinness has long had a presence in the Southwest. And some of you may or may not know that um, we've got a large concentration of sheltered housing right in the city centre um, on a very busy thoroughfare called Hevertree. Um, and right next to that, so we've got Eaton House, we've got John Hannam House, which is a much smaller specialist development for people that have physical disabilities. And just recently, um, we bought the redundant swimming pool that sits right next to these two developments. And in my preparations for this session today, um, I was fortunate enough to have a bit of a session with our group development director and he's given me the green light to say to you today that we're going to explore opportunities for intergenerational intergener living on this site. So, you know, I'm going to take a lot of the learning from today and from my colleagues in order to kind of move forward this project and I'm really keen to kind of stimulate discussion around question and answers today because we're going from a real sort of blank sheet of paper um, and I'm traveling hopefully as my mother always says to me in my kind of one woman crusade in Guinness to get intergenerational living into the fore really. Um, that was all from me it was a bit of a whistle stop because I think there are lots of questions and lots of comments in the chat and back to you Jeremy. 
Lynn, that was fantastic. And what exciting news about the potential development in Exeter. Fingers we, crossed. We, we, will, we will not only uh, support your, your one-person campaign, but we'll also <laughs> add voice to it where appropriate. Um, and I know that Sally's just posted a, a, a link into uh, the chat box of a new intergenerational housing steering group that we've join yes. part of the founding uh, group so uh, I think that's something that we will watch and follow with interest as well as help, help helpfully influence but what strikes me across all the presentations is whether it's health inequality um, housing inequity or stricter social or lack of social ineligibility is that there is a growing trend to looking at self-care social prescribing, uh, self-management, co-production, and, and looking at collaborative ways. And what we've tried to sort of draw out from each of you is, is issues around that. Uh, so can I just thank you, first of all, before I go into the Q&A for, for each of your contributions and uh, the thread that that, is, uh, that that has enabled us to pursue uh, this morning. We've got a half dozen or so questions, a, a variety of ones, and perhaps we can just start off with the intergenerational one from uh, from Maggie, Maggie Gilbert, who's uh, joined us at several of the sessions this week and posed some really interesting questions. Um, her first one here is, that, is it, it is vital to bring together intergenerational activities and ad hoc social care. Remember how effective old folk homes for, uh, for, for four year olds was. For those of you who can't remember, that was a Channel 4 series, I think, with, a, with another Bristol operator, Sir Monica Trust. Um, at the time, and, and then I think subsequently repeated with extra care, child for trust. Um, uh, so she, she sort of draws attention to the role between sort of living well, but also that fulfilling lives and being happy. Um, are there any things around that? Can I ask you about, you know, issues around compressing dependency, looking much more positively about psychologically informed environments? Nick, can I kick off with you? Because you drew attention to sort of safety, security and affordability and things like that. But how does that relate to happiness and perhaps compressing some of the real challenges around health inequalities? I think just briefly, it's about, for me, it's, the question struck me, it's about everyone having a contribution to make. And if you're starting off focusing on that and working outwardly from there, you, you go on a different journey, I think, of discovery with people. If you're just focusing on problems, deficits, issues, concerns, which shouldn't be ignored and we shouldn't uh, write them off, um, you, I think you miss the, the whole person within that. Yeah, yeah. So seeing people for the contributions that they can make and helping nurture those as part of the support, whatever that looks like, should be a core principle of any help, I think, within our world and sector. Yeah, and, and Nick, I'll just 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 add a supplementary question to that. I mean, and it's not specifically intergenerational, but you know, you and I have signed up to making it real and some of the work from social care future. Do you see that as a as a way of taking this agenda forward and making it real for people, as opposed to just being in the policy sphere? Yeah, absolutely do. Yeah, I think I think we've seen a real movement of people across all sorts of different sectors and strands who are trying to reimagine what good help and support looks and feels like I think and starting from some more fundamental principles of relationships and I think now it's just about how do we tackle the bureaucracy and the systematic issues that are stopping that from becoming the the driving paradigm I think that I'm really interested mm -hmm. in and I think we've heard lots of really interesting examples of that from the other presentations today about that I think a lot of it is just about getting on and doing it and then trying to learn from doing. I'm a great believer in that. And Joe, if I could just sort of vary it slightly, because um, there was a question, I think, in the chat box uh, posted by Robin, which is about, you know, ICBs and you know, ICSs aren't really addressing this. From a health foundation perspective, looking at the broader health economy, can you see that sort of intergenerational, not so that's intergenerational, actually more integrated approaches mm -hmm. being delivered um, and, and recognising, I think, one of your final slides about how do you get this, you know, how, 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 we, how, how we have a much more broader coalition around health, uh, health gain? I, I was actually... Um just mulling that question of um of intergenerational um kind of cohesion mm. um, and and there was another question asked about um about sort of rural urban yeah divide <clears throat> and and how that might relate to to the, the kind of research we were looking at and certainly the the the, the trends that we've seen in uh in 
housing security, people losing their tenure and being and, and the gap in affordability surely is exacerbating that that challenge because if people are having to move out of their communities, they're having to move out of where their uh, where their parents and grandparents where well, they might have grown up in order to uh, driven by that affordability challenge, then that's like one of those short term cuts through the through the cuts to the um, through, to the local housing allowance, then creating long term costs through that lack of social connections and lack of family connections. And that that has a cost for the families that might be having to move out, but also has a cost for the um, the the generations that might be left behind. Um, and I think that speaks to a you know something that we don't we're we're interested in, but um, don't look at enough, which is the impact of of kind of internal migration um, driven by either lack of opportunity in areas where people grow up or. Um, the rising housing costs and people being forced to move out of their um, established community and how that kind of fracturing of, fracturing of communities um, has, an, has an impact on health. Um, and then you get these kind of sink places where, where the, that are left behind and, and actually where the sickest people end up moving to because the accommodation is cheaper, like I mentioned, Blackpool and Hastings. Mm. Um, and, and the housing element of that is, yeah, is, is, is uh, it's not suitable, they're not suitable accommodation for people to live in, um, but they're also um, kind of don't have those community connections. Um, so that was that was a, a reflection. I think ICS is um, certainly should be a place where the, the housing and the health um, kind of um, infrastructure and, and uh, decision making power is brought together. Um, we we are doing uh, colleagues in the, the health foundation are, are kind of reviewing all the plans that ICSs are making to see mm. to what extent they're taking into account things like uh, the building blocks of health. So the, taking into account housing and health inequalities in their um, in their goal setting. So it would be that's that's kind of analysis that's underway because ICSs are, are quite young. But I'd I'd seen reflected in some of the comments that the um experience that people are having of ICSs is, is that they are they're, that they're not having that reach of bringing together all those services and all those perspectives um which which is a concern if it's if it's not um but is you know also people have pointed out how the the cuts have been deepest in the areas that have the highest levels of need so yeah um, yeah so you know that that if you haven't got the resources to uh, to invest, then um, that's going to make that kind of collaboration more difficult as well. And what struck me about your presentation also from an intergenerational perspective, uh, Joe, was also that you drew attention to the health disparities, not just in later life, mm -hmm. but also right through the life course as well. Um, and yes, we need to look at compression of mortality and dependency levels, but actually if we don't get the building blocks early on, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, sort of translating that from a co-housing perspective, Jim, if there are any other pieces of research, because I think you did some work um, for DLUC, looking at issues around loneliness and isolation as well, and other sort of uh, inequalities, if I'm right. Or, or, is there anything around that intergenerational piece and health impact that you could sort of highlight? Yeah, um, you're you're right. Yes, it's, I'm slightly rusty because that was uh, a bit uh, a while yeah, ago. I know <laughs> a little while ago. The, yeah, the it was it was pre DLUC. It was the Ministry of Housing and Local Government at the time. Yeah, so we um, we kind of it's what kind of led to the to the Sheik project really yeah. that we had looked more broadly at um, well being and and loneliness within that project and we we managed to make it quantitative uh to a greater degree by doing a survey of uh anyone we could reach across the country on co-housing or housing co-ops it wasn't particularly um, directed at age which is a point you've just picked up on it's interesting yeah. that as kind of loneliness pathways that follow us through uh, life and are connected to other other aspects um but what we we found interestingly was um uh, so we we were able to compare i think we got um six seven hundred um responses to a questionnaire that was uh that followed 
um, the UCLA, I think it is, scales of a, a set of questions for loneliness and well-being, which also relate to health. Um, and we we found that uh, the the set of data that we had for people living in some form of uh, collaborative housing or involved with it, um, uh, we were able to show that those people had a greater sense, a greater level of well-being and were less lonely. Yeah than the, the wider population, even against people directly comparable in terms of, of income and area and location who were equally um, active in, in in terms of numbers of social links. Uh, what we what we did find actually that we kind of buried a little bit, but I think it's it's come back to us now that there was there was something about and somebody asked this, was it in the QA? I think it was. Um, is was the that Abdul? Um, after Abdul's, actually, I haven't forgotten, uh, Nick Henley, if you don't mind oh, me, yeah, Nick's, yeah. because it, it relates very quickly, is the benefit of living in self-managed community to do mm. with yeah. um, it's It's to do with sense of control. And I think there's a strong, in terms of, of general well-being, we had this finding from this previous piece of research that you were it worked just as well um, you had as as much positive social connection from from the development phase of those groups before people moved in, and in a way that was an awkward finding. We didn't really it shouldn't really fit with our thesis, um, but it does make sense. I think it it relates to that that sense of purpose and um, and and drive towards a, a goal as a group, and and I, I guess our response to the the finding really was that's that's great but it's not sustainable you can't be in development as a group forever um so the, the we the the, the benefits of, of living once you've moved into those groups were also very significant yeah Sorry, that's a really I good point wandered off your, good. your original question onto the no 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 that, that's really helpful that's really helpful and that sustainability is, is a critical thing as the group evolves as, as you know as the changes the it ages that you know uh, i think some of the chic evaluations sort of draws attention to that uh, really eloquently lynn in terms of intergenerational as well as picking up some of the other questions um any any thoughts further thoughts we, we're fortunate enough to have a couple of um, health and wellbeing coordinators and um, kind of a, a modest team of people that work in our social investment. So we have had, we've had a lot of success doing things at quite a local level, as colleagues have suggested today, where we've tapped into um, Kind of those local people, local established groups, and brought those into our services, and and that that because we already had those networks when the pandemic hit, for example, we did things like um, decorate your windows for Christmas so that people didn't feel quite so isolated, and people would walk around the outside of the schemes and and judge them and things like that, and you know just just really trying to, to think about how we're connecting people all the time. It's a constant challenge, isn't it? And I noticed that in the Q&A, um, a lot of colleagues are talking about how we can, how we can lobby local government yeah. um, or central government really to yeah. free up some of, um, some of the funding that is so desperately need for, needed for things like that. It's now that, you know, supporting people money is, is sort of dead and gone really. Yeah. I was going to come on to that as our final question, actually, Lynn, because I think, you know, both at a big P and, and a little P, um, you know, we've got we've got a general election coming up. We're members of something called the Housing Ageing Alliance, and we're, we're setting out a manifesto yes. uh, in, the, in the coming weeks uh, to say, you know, what can uh, national government set out? Um, please do follow that on the Lynn website, the HAA, Housing Ageing Alliance. Um, but can I just go around everybody thinking about um, what type of, power and i think nick you talked about power and control from the australian perspective some of that was bottom up informing grassroots but also what how about that informing at a higher level any examples drawing on what james has set out in his question um yeah i, th I think it's about for me about the system trying to learn together and trying to look at why we work in such silos and opportunities to work more collaboratively 
in partnership with local communities and local citizens. And I think um, moving towards leadership styles and approaches that facilitate more of that, I think, is what we need. But then I think we need better ways of understanding what works and why, and then using that learning to influence change. And I think we've got some good examples from local area coordination where, for instance, in York, they made some quite significant changes to the way they did um, uh, gas checks on, in people's homes as a consequence of, of learning from local area coordination and the impact that was having on people's lives. So it's like, how do you kind of use learning um, differently, I think? Um, and I think that does, that shouldn't have to cost much. I think that's the other thing. It doesn't, mm. it's not all about money, I don't think. I think some of this is about commitment to thinking outside the box that we need. And and Joe, I mean, the, the Ombudsman recently announced uh, in his report and Chris Whitty in his State of the Aging report, but the Ombudsman in particular talked about the need for a Health and Housing Commission. Do you think that type of lobbying and influence would be appropriate? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk, I'll talk about having that picture of, of Nye Bevan on the slide because it, it was yeah. the, you know, the Secretary of State, wasn't he, for Health and yeah. Housing? Um, and, that's, and that's often been kind of a call. Um, you know, we talk about the building blocks of health and needing to integrate that integrate kind of the health aims into housing policy. But it's not just housing policy; it's also social security, it's yeah. also education and yeah. and children's services. So <clears throat> I wouldn't necessarily kind of pick housing only as the as you know. I think that it's a, it's about having health and health inequalities perspective and a goal throughout um, policy making throughout services. Um, but on that on that question of lack of power and control, um, I mentioned I was at, at a, an event earlier this week looking at the renters reform mill with the renters reform yep. coalition, um, and really those stories of people not being able to challenge the mould in their ceiling or the uh, the standards there, the the conditions they're living in because of that lack of lack of power and control and living at the whim of the landlord was really hard hitting. And thank, thanks very much, Joe. And, and Jim, any thoughts about that bigger picture, you know, influencing? Where can we position co-housing, drawing on the contribution you've made to the UK co-housing network, perhaps trying to, perhaps, is there a role to influence the older person's housing task force at the moment, for example? Well, in, indeed. If only someone was here from that task force, Jeremy, they are. But... Well, I am, but uh, <laughs> I shall, I, I'm a load um, there, yeah. Yeah, very much so. And I, I think the message is, has got to be this is this is a part of the of the jigsaw puzzle this is not a luxury this these ideas around collaborative housing they will uh, they will improve our society and they will save us money in the long term I think that's that's got yeah, to be so that cost efficiency and care efficiency. Well, look, before I conclude, I just want to give Lynn the last word. Thanks ever so, Lynn, for hosting and being a sponsor of this really informative session. Any final thoughts or comments that you'd like to make? I mean, I just wanted to draw people's attention to the fact that the regulator of social housing has just um, published this week the final measures. And I think what's really interesting is that um, you know, they've recognised the fact that it's housing and neighbourhoods. And so it's incumbent. I mean, I think I said to my colleagues when we were preparing for this event, it's incumbent on us, I think, as as providers and people with a, a common interest to to make those neighbourhoods, to create those places, ageing in place. We talk about ageing in place, don't we? We talk about mm. placemaking now that we're, we're moving away from, aren't we, those kind of um, categorised housing models. And I think it's really important that we think about things in a much more broader context going forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, look, um, on behalf of the Housing Lynn, can I thank each and every one of you for your wonderful presentations, really stimulating uh, both the discussion, but also thought provoking in the, the research that you've shared, the information about local practice and you as agencies wanting to, to take forward a number of initiatives uh, collaboratively. Uh, we look forward to following uh, new reports coming out from Nick. Any other research, Joe? future work with you, Jim, and, and obviously the intergenerational scheme um, in Exeter, hopefully once it sort of comes off the ground. Um, 
It just, yes, I'll join you with that, fingers crossed, Lynn, absolutely. Um, can I just thank um, our sponsor, Guinness Partnership, again, for their very generous support. Thanks very much, Lynn and the team. We look forward to seeing you soon. Um, if you want to be involved with the Lynn in other ways, you want to speak at a future event, you want to sponsor other sessions, or want to engage with us, please do um, contact us on our info box, our info at housinglynn.org.uk. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Sally and Jerome, who you see here, and Alice behind the scenes for helping to put on this excellent session. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about issues around regenerating local communities, perhaps answer some of the questions on decent homes um, and the renters reform bill, because uh, renters reform legislation, because we've got Lord Best chairing our final session this afternoon. And he obviously took some of this work through the House of Lords. Uh, as well. But for now, a big thank you to all our speakers and our sponsor, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you hopefully at 2.30 for our final session of this summit, a festival of ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.